We have two speakers today. First, let me introduce David Rawson, one of Adventist Risk Management's senior account executives. David has a wealth of knowledge about insurance and safety. Hi, David. Hi, David. Also joining us is Karina Franca, our marketing analyst. Welcome back, Karina. Thank you, David. Okay, let me just go ahead and turn the program over to you. Thanks, David. Um, today's presentation is um, targeted primarily to our uh, safety officers or those involved in the safety, safety officer program. And um, I'm really pleased by that because there's a message that we want to get be able to get out to the safety officers about the importance of the responsibility uh, that we place on you. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we, um, we're asking the safety officers to be actively involved in inspections of the church facilities and the schools, uh, maintenance, active maintenance program and maintenance overview, uh, being involved with leadership and crisis planning, uh, taking a look at the problems that do occur and finding solutions to, to, help, to help them not reoccur in the future. But the section that we're going to really focus in on today is what we term activity review, where as a safety officer, you'll take a leadership role in reviewing the activities that the folks are engaged in and um, actually uh, overseeing uh, how it's organized and so on. And one sub element of that is what we're really focusing in on today, and that's uh, transportation. Yeah, uh, I would like just to reinforce the importance and emphasize the importance of the safety officer. You know, one might think it's a lot of information, they might get overwhelmed, but it is really important that they keep in mind that maintenance is the key to success. And if they have their maintenance schedules done, uh, we can prevent the losses. And that's a very good, important thing to think about. So without further ado, we're going to start in on the transportation element of the activity review. We're going to look at transportation from three different perspectives. Use of the vehicles that we're utilizing in our programs, the repair and upkeep of those vehicles, and selecting the drivers that we're going to use for our church outings or our school outings. These are the three components that we're gonna look at today. Wow. So those are really pictures you've taken in your trips? Yeah, actually, <clears throat> these are international shots as, as most of you can, can tell, and they represent real problems. Do people really do that in other countries? They don't respect laws. Uh, you know, it's crazy. One of the things we take for granted in this country is the fact that we have laws that dictate how people behave. Um, in many countries, I found that they're much looser in the application of, um, if they do have a legal structure, in the application of the laws that pertain to it. As you can see, on the, the, the picture on the left uh, was taken on the way up the Himalaya toward Darjeeling in India, and we have a gentleman in the luggage rack. Uh, also, we have a pickup truck with way more people in the bed than, just, than should be there, and as a matter of fact, no one should be in the bed. But lest we think that these problems are only central to our international clients, we've got something here that will open our eyes to the challenges that we face in North America. Yeah, what is, what is wrong with this picture, Dave? Well, if you'll take a look at the pickup truck in the background. Well, first of all, let's look at the foreground. The foreground are two ARM safety officers who are overseeing the activities that are involved at the Oshkosh Campery back in 2009. If you'll focus in on the pickup truck right behind them, 
you'll notice that there are four individuals standing up around the oh, outside yeah. of the bed of the truck. Yes. Uh, holding on uh, for dear life. So you cannot. You don't need to go to India to see that happening. <laughs> hey, we've got it right here in the United States, unfortunately. The thing that makes this, the thing that we need to focus in on as it relates to this particular instance, no one would drive down the road with four people hanging off the side of a truck. But because this activity is on the camp itself, on the camp facility itself, we all too often take liberties that we probably shouldn't take. And as a result, we'll see things like this. The problem is these things can lead to serious injury. Use, vehicle use. Uh, we call it the tool principle. The tool needs to match the purpose for which the tool was designed. That's the important part of what the tool serves. In a vehicle, the number of seats should dictate the number of riders. No seat belt, no passenger. And we shouldn't ever exceed the allowable gross weight that the vehicle is rated for. So the rules are pretty simple, it looks like. We just need to follow the rules and the problems will be less and less, right? Exactly right. The problem is it seems all too often it's too easy to circumvent the rules. <laughs> the second component that we want to focus in on this morning or this afternoon is the maintenance of the vehicle. Um, all too often, we take for granted when we get in the car that it's going to do precisely what we want it to do. The problem is we are taking personal responsibility. We have individuals under our care, custody, and control that we are being assigned responsibility for to get from point A to point B in a church-related activity. We want to be sure that we've done everything that we possibly can do to ensure their safety. So one of the things that we like to encourage is pre-trip inspections uh, before we start out on an activity. This is simple things. It's logical things. Check your fl fluid levels. Be sure the belts and the hoses uh, are, are in good tact and the tire pressures are where they should be. Check the lights and turn signals. You know, just the other day I was driving down the road and a policeman pulled me over and told me my brake light on the left side rear wasn't working. Uh, I hadn't taken the time to check. Uh, this is all too easy to do is jump into the vehicle and assume that everything's okay. Uh, take the time, encourage the time by those who are driving your vehicles and those who oversee your vehicles Take the time to be sure before it hits the road that everything's been done to check that it is working appropriately. When you're out on a trip and you have a problem and you bring the vehicle back, be sure that you document the problem that you had with the vehicle and then make sure a process is put in place to be sure that that problem's resolved before that vehicle goes out on the road again. These are just simple, straightforward uh, steps that need to be taken to ensure the safety of those we're responsible for. Uh, Dave, when, when I have a getaway trip for the weekend, my husband is pretty good doing that, trying to make sure everything is working well, proper, so we can have a safe trip. But in case that a, a church or organization, they don't do often trips, so how often should they make sure that the car, their, their transportation, it's working properly? Um, you know, it's going to depend on the amount of usage that you actually have, of course. I mean, if you're only driving a vehicle two or three times a year, you're not looking to do um, routine maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, at least do biannual, a biannual tune-up on a vehicle that's owned by the church. Be sure that at least biannually, that vehicle's checked because even a vehicle that set, sits and unused, there's those that'll say that's worse or that's harder on a vehicle than mm -hmm. actually taking it out on the road and driving it. Mm -hmm. So at least do a biannual check. 
for a school bus that's out there on the road every day, picking kids up, dropping kids off, that should be checked on a much more frequent basis. And then um, keep the records. It was very, very absolutely, important. Absolutely. Keep the records. This, the second point I want to make in this regard, and I ran into this personally not long ago, uh, one of our school buses was being maintained by a local church member who was a mechanic and had done mechanical type work in the past. But two things were creating a problem. One, he wasn't certified as a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it was a freebie for the church, which saved him money, but the individual wasn't certified. The second problem that was created was the fact that many of our vehicles today are checked using computers. They tie into computer systems. This individual didn't have access to the computers that were necessary to do the check and to ensure that the vehicle was in proper working order. Yeah, that was a question I was going to ask you. If is that it's okay to have a church member if they have a service shop, if it was okay to bring one of the transportations uh, from the church to be fixed, to be serviced in that proper in that shop, if it's okay to have a church member taking care of that. A certified mechanic that's a church member that has a shop with the proper tools to do the job, absolutely. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We just want to be sure that we get away from using people who have good intent but don't have either the equipment or the knowledge to do mm -hmm. the job. So those are the things we want to shy away from. The third part of the presentation has to do with the drivers that we're going to use when we go out on um, our trips. Um, not a lot of time is often given uh, to the evaluation of the drivers we use. Um, one of the things that we need to consider is whether or not the individual that is going to be driving is properly licensed. What I mean by properly licensed, they may have a, a local state driver's license, mm -hmm. but if they're driving a 15 passenger van, which we'll talk about more <laughs> in a few minutes, or if they're, if they're driving a school bus, they need to have a commercial driver's license. A simple state driver's license is not going to be adequate to do the job. We want to be sure that they've been trained and they've passed the requirements to be able to operate a vehicle of the type that they are being asked to operate. So proper licensing is vitally important uh, as a first step. Secondly is comply with all state, federal, and provincial laws as it relates to who drives these vehicles. Okay, if there's any nuances in the in the state law that would preclude an individual from driving because of age, because of how they're licensed or for other reasons, we need to know what those requirements are. And we need to be sure that the individuals are complying with the requirements. Thirdly, and really important, is the age and maturity of the driver. Mm -hmm. General Conference working pol or NAD working policy re recommends that an individual be at least 21 years of age. I think it's a good rule of thumb to use 21 as the age barrier for taking groups out on church activities where you have young people or church members being, being involved and in the vehicles. I know some conferences have approved um, drivers uh, 19 and above. Um, Obviously, we prefer to see the 21 threshold, but uh, certainly you want no one younger than 19 operating a vehicle that's transporting your church members or your kids. Um, also, no more than two traffic citations. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Should we check the citations and see how is their background in that regard? You know, Karina, both from the standpoint of checking for their traffic violations. Um, obviously, if your traffic violations are running a stop sign or speeding, mm -hmm. these are two things that you might look at differently. But if a person has an ongoing record 
of traffic citations, whatever form they take, we don't want them mm -hmm. transporting mm -hmm. our church members. So it's vitally important that they um, have a clean driving record. So let's refresh our minds. So what are the top three things a safety officer should be looking for before they agree upon somebody else drive the church vehicle? The license matches the use and the vehicle type that they're utilizing. That they be above the age of 21 with at least three years of, of experience. driving experience and that they have a clean driving record. Great. Thank uh, you. Those three are, and let me add one thing, Karina, before we go on as it relates to drivers. Um, and this has, it doesn't have to do specifically with the safety issues concerning driving, but it does have something to do with an area that Adventist Risk Management is sincerely concerned about, and that's the whole issue of sexual molestation and sexual misconduct. You know that we have recommended that steps be taken to be sure that everyone's background checked before they interface with our, particularly our kids. Mm -hmm. In this instance, you're asking your young people to get into a car with a driver who may not have been background checked. Perfect opportunity for an individual to take the kids out away from their lo location and abuse, molest, whatever term you want to associate with them. I think it's just important in the world we're living in today to do a background check on uh, sexual misconduct as it is on how many traffic citations mm -hmm. they have. We want to be sure, one, clean driving record. We want to be sure, two, they don't have a sexual molestation sure. background. It's very important. I want to make and I want to emphasize a point. Um, distracted driving. You know, it used to be 15 years ago, a distracted driver was either eating while they were driving down the road, or maybe they had a car load of children that were boisterous <laughs> and unruly. Uh, I've even seen instances in heavy traffic in the Los Angeles area where they may be reading the newspaper or a book mm -hmm. or looking at maps or whatever while they're stopped in traffic. That used to be the extent of uh, distracted driving 15 years ago. Today's a whole different world. Yes. I mean, we text at baseball games, we text at parties, we text at home in the evening, we text at work during the day. While you're talking to friends. We text while talking <laughs> to friends. Texting has become a way of life. And I know I can speak for myself. Um, I can be driving down the road, checking the baseball scores on my phone while I'm driving my car. This has become a way of life. This okay, has become a, a pattern of behavior mm -hmm. in our society. We need to be sure that we have made it very clear to anyone that's operating a vehicle that these type of activities are unacceptable. Yes, especially when you're driving a church vehicle and you have other passengers' lives that depend on your distraction or not distraction while Absolutely. you were driving. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's a it's a must that they lay everything aside when they're driving. As a matter of fact, I would like to encourage the safety officers to work with church leadership to establish a policy on distracted driving. Um, it is that will detail to anyone that drives on behalf of that church or school what your expectations are in terms of driving. No phones, mm -hmm. um, no, no literature, um, no eating, just drive. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is just drive. So let's put a policy in place. Establish a written policy that people can view. Hand out the policy before you go on your trips. 
Let everyone look at what the expectations are before the, ch before the vehicle ever leaves the church or school property so that everyone is clear on what the expectations are. If there's a phone call and it's an emergency situation, pass the phone to someone else in the vehicle. Don't take the call yourself. Dave, uh, we've been talking about uh, driving the church's vehicle, the organization's vehicle. How about uh, if I'm driving my vehicle for a church event? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, this gets into the issue of using uh, personal vehicles for church outings, school outings, that type of thing. First of all, I want to acknowledge, and everyone listening understands this, it happens all the time. Adventist risk management, as a matter of policy and procedure, advises against the use of personal vehicles, and there's, there's reasons why. Um, number one, just the various things we've talked about, that is uh, the maintenance and how a vehicle's been maintained can be called into question when it comes to personal vehicles. Uh, also, the issue of insurance comes into play. How's the insurance um, uh, limits of insurance that are being carried on a particular vehicle? Um, there's certain things that you need to make very clear if you get into the situation where you have 10 cars taking a group of church members on a picnic on a Sabbath afternoon. Let the drivers know, let the owners of the vehicle know that their auto insurance is primary in the event that something were to happen. That means their insurance will respond first before any insurance from the church or the school will come to bear. Make sure that drivers, again, get back to this age issue. Make sure the drivers are at least 21 years of age. Mm -hmm. Make a copy of their driver's license and keep that copy of their driver's license on file. Make sure that the limits of insurance are $100,000 per person or $300,000 per occurrence minimum. Get a proof of insurance card from them indicating that they have insurance. Also go through the steps of finding out what their driving record is. Don't overload the vehicle like we've mm -hmm, talked before mm -hmm. and require, make sure there's only one passenger for every seat belt. Mm -hmm. We want to be sure that everybody has a seat belt before we start down the road in a personal vehicle. Mm -hmm. Great. So, phase out your 15 passenger vans. I have heard many issues and concerns about the topic. And because it continues to present a serious risk to your organization, why is that? And why is ARM, what is ARM position on that topic? Can you explain me a little bit about it? Most of you that have been to any ARM meeting or have been involved with uh, church, the church insurance program through the years knows that that Adventist Risk Management has advoc advocated phasing out 15 passenger vans. We don't want to see them. The question's always asked, well, why? Um, the reason is simple. They're high profile vehicles that are subject to rollover. Mm -hmm. And when you load them up with 15 people, uh, it just exacerbates a problem that is already very serious. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is they're dangerous. We need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of comments this gives me opportunity to make, and I'll do it quickly. One, Adventist Risk Management has felt really strongly about this issue through the years. So strongly, as a matter of fact, that there was a period of time in which we were suggesting to our conferences and our clients that we weren't going to provide insurance coverage on these vehicles at a, at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. We backed away from that because, again, it's Adventist risk management's responsibility to see that the church is adequately protected. Mm -hmm. So we never felt clear in taking that step. Then we went through the process of adding on a surcharge or a fee mm -hmm. for owning mm -hmm. and insuring a 15-passenger van. We've also rolled back on that. Mm -hmm. 
But I do want to make the point, if you have a 15 passenger van, see how fast you can get rid of it. Okay. And have there ever been incidents in the church with a 15 passenger van that you know about? Well, I'm going to tell you one experience I had driving back from the Atlanta General Conference session. Uh, I was coming up the interstate toward Washington, D.C., and I came up behind a vehicle that was weaving down the road. Um, it, it, um, it was a 15-passenger van, and it had a trailer attached to the back of it. Um, I said to myself as I was coming up behind it, I'm sure glad that this is not a church-owned van <laughs> because uh, I would feel absolutely terrible because this looked like an accident ready to happen. Lo and behold, I drove around the van, looked at the side of the van, and it said Seventh-day Adventist no. Church with our logo right on it. And I thought to myself, oh, man, you know, I just prayed as I went by that the Lord would somehow get those people back to their church mm -hmm. and uh, get them back safe. Uh, there were at least 15 people in that van. There may have been more. There was a luggage rack on top of the van, which wow. added additional weight. The back end of the van was way down. The front end of the van was way up. And the trailer Terrible. obviously had a lot of weight on the back end. So you had a, a situation where the van was kind of fishtailing back and forth as it went down the road because it was hard to control. So, yes, the bottom line is have seen it, have been there. Uh, oh. <laughs> don't want to see it again. Uh, please uh, take seriously the whole issue So, uh, 15 passenger vans. Uh, what are the recommendations? For if you've those, got one yeah. and if you're bound and determined to use it, going to go back to what we talked about before, at least 21 years of age, at least three years of driving experience. Please don't put anyone with less than three years of driving experience out there with a van full of people in a 15 passenger van. We would prefer to see a commercial driver's license, great driving record, and, an, and some preliminary training on the use in, of uh, 15 passenger vans before they ever think about taking a group out on the road. In conclusion, make sure that your vehicles are repaired and maintained on a regular basis periodic basis. Make sure that your drivers are well trained and um, have the correct driver's license for the kind of vehicle you're asking them to drive. And three, fit the use of the vehicle to what it was designed to do. If you've got a pickup truck, if you can put people in the cab, use the back for what it was designed to do, and that's to carry things. Mm -hmm. Don't put people in the back of your pickup trucks. <laughs> One of the things that I want to point out in closing, and that is that um, there is a form for field trips that uh, we offer via our website, uh, www.adventistrisk.org. It's under the tab on forms, and you scroll down until you come to risk control. You click on risk control and scroll down till you come to field trip form. What that provides is not only a checklist for the things that we've talked about today, but it also provides a checklist for everything else you should be thinking about great. before you go out on an activity. That's great. We want to thank you all for um, being here today. And uh, we hope that the little bit we've been able to share uh, between Karina and myself has been helpful uh, to each of you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you both David and Karina for sharing with us today. If you have additional questions, um, please do not hesitate to write us, uh, write directly to me at D Fournier, that's D-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R, at AdventistRisk.org, and I will direct the questions to uh, the, the subject matter expert, possibly Dave, Karina, or one of our other staff members. Um, just want to remind you that the Safety Officer Webinar Series is an ongoing series. We will be meeting again next month. Uh, mark your calendar for August 20 at 2.30. August 20 at 2.30, and that webinar will be John Dugan, our Senior Risk Control um, specialist 
talking about building a church emergency plan. That would be a very important topic. I hope you'll join us for that discussion. If there are no other questions, and I don't see any, I will thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time.